thanks for coming and, and uh, making it here. You, you have the distinct and unique uh, opportunity because this is the only topic all week in the two days on open data. Everything else here is open code as far as I can tell. Um, but Overture Maps Foundation, uh, which I represent, is an open data project. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, my name is Mark Prelo. I'm the executive director of Overture Maps. Um, Overture Maps, well, we'll talk a little bit about what it is, but the goal of Overture Maps is to build open map data. And um, our vision as we do it is to build map data. Um, and, and it kind of comes from the belief that mapping has changed in the last 20 years. 20 years ago, if you were going to build a map, you built it by survey. You sent people out, usually professionals, and went out and surveyed uh, the world, and they would record that and digitize it, and the map would be a digital record of that survey. But that started changing about, about when the iPhone came in, uh, or about when smartphones came in, because all of a sudden, sensors were out there that were detecting things about the world, and then feeding that back. And all of a sudden, when you get the combination of mobile devices, location-enabled, cloud compute, um, uh, and now AI, all of a sudden you have a very different model where the best maps, we think, are the maps that are used the most and that have sensors that are continually updating that data. And so Overture was really started um, based on sort of an interest on a number of companies to make uh, open map data. Um, so in the mapping space, why do open map data? Everyone else here is doing open code. Uh, and there are a number of great open code projects in the navigation world. But the reason we did, oh. is that better? OK, that's better. <laughs> if you missed the first part, it wasn't recorded. Um, uh, the, the reason we focused on open map data is because in mapping, and mapping, you know, as you know, has become a um, pretty important horizontal platform across so many digital areas. A lot of people here are automotive, it's, that's obviously one, but it's important to many, many industries. And the hard part about mapping is, is not the software, not that the software is trivial, but the data is extremely non-trivial. The data takes thousands of people every year to keep mapping and, uh, and, and building data all the time. And so data is really the hard part and so when we started Overture, rather than going after some of the software layers that, that are already being done by a couple others, we really wanted to go after the data part, and, and largely because that was the hard one. So we started, um, Overture was started uh, almost two years ago. Uh, it was started um, as a project in the first four founders. In fact, when it was founded, the only four uh, members of Overture were um, some companies you may have heard of, uh, Meta, Microsoft, Amazon, and TomTom out of Amsterdam. And those four companies were steering members of the project and really committed to make it happen. Uh, since then, we've grown. We're about 36 companies now. I think there are a couple logos missing on here uh, that just joined uh, last week. But we're about 36 companies uh, that are all working to make open map data. And uh, the project's two years old. We uh, in uh, June of this year, we launched several of our layers as, as uh, general availability. It's starting to be adopted. Uh, TomTom uses it in their Orbis platform, which is in a number of automotive OEMs. Microsoft is using it in Bing Maps. Um, Meta is using it in, in their maps across Facebook and Instagram and other, other products. Esri, which is a big geospatial company, has it in their Living Atlas, and it's going out to many people. And so we're in early days, but we're starting to see a lot of adoption. I think one of the key things about this, besides the logo, is building map data is not cheap. It's not trivial. Um, and one of the things that we wanted to do is make sure that we could de-risk that by having adequate funding and an ad adequate community around it so that, so that people could look at it and make long-term bets on the data without worrying that it was going to go away. Um, so that, those are the folks who are in it. Um, and so, does anyone here work with map data? I, I, I don't know how many, how, I'll, I'll, I'll assume you don't unless you all raise your hands and tell me you do. And, and so, so if you think about a map stack, if you think about any app, all of you probably use map data. Um, if you think about that map stack, there's some software, some data at the bottom of it. And the data ends up being, you think of roads, but also addresses and buildings and what does Tokyo include and, and you know, various types of data. 
And that data is basically digital representations of the physical world. That's, that's essentially what map data is. is it, and then that data is, is run through the uh, usually some value added layer. So what's a value added layer? So um, a place might be a restaurant. But the value-added layers are what are the reviews of that restaurant, or what's the footfall traffic of that restaurant, or what are pictures of that restaurant if you're a social media, or what are food inspection records if you're a city. So lots of value-added layers get added onto that data, and then it's put out through some sort of proprietary API or SDK. And so that's kind of been the stack of everyone sort of building that um, in a proprietary fashion. And what Overture decide, wanted to do is come out and kind of change that model. One of the things we realized is that if you think about mappings, maps, and I think everyone here probably uses maps in some way, and you think about to 10 years ago how maps were built or what you got out of a map, it was a very different experience, right? If you're navigating, it was kind of like go down there about, you know, a kilometer and then turn right and then go to another street, turn right. That was kind of the level of guidance you have. But if you think about in navigation, what level of guidance you have, it's get in this lane, get in the second lane from the, I guess here it's usually the left, get in the second lane for the left. You have signage, which is in there. You have speed limits, you have traffic. And so what's really happened and made mapping much more interesting now is the amount of data has completely exploded um, uh, in, in terms of making more and more interesting applications. So in that context, what you've got if you're building maps is this never-ending cycle of more and more data. And what happens is um, the data gets better, the applications get better, and very quickly the ungrateful users move their expectations right up to the edge. I mean, the, the, and then what they want is something better than that, right? And so the example I always use um, is, you know, 10 years ago, if you called a taxi and the taxi said, I will be there in 30 minutes, you'd probably go down to the corner 20 minutes before because the person might show up a little early and you wouldn't be terribly surprised if they showed up in 40 minutes. But now if you call a taxi or a ride share and they tell you we'll be there in six minutes, when do you get upset? Like seven minutes. It's, you know, our expectations are very high and all that has to be backed up in the data that, that comes out. So Overture's model was, if you're going to build it open, not all, the infra, not all that spatial data will be open. Some of it will be proprietary, some of it will be private, some of it will be companies' specific competitive advantage, but all that can tie into some open base map, some open base layer. So here's what that means is if I think about a road, a road goes from you know, a certain, uh, uh, it has a certain geometry to it, it connects to certain roads, it has certain directionality, but at some point, we stop making open data for that. We say, we've represented the road, we've represented the road network. Our goal is to make that highly accurate and highly up to date, but we're gonna let other people attach data to that. So if traffic is gonna be added to that, we want people to be able to do that. And the way we do that is through something I'll talk a little bit more about, a, a mechanism to let people attach data. And then we're not a, we're not a software company. So people, we, we're trying to build data, other people, or sorry, I'm sorry, a software project, other people will use their software. But again, we're solving the data part of it because we think that's really the hard part of it uh, in mapping. There are other open mapping projects. Um, uh, and, uh, the major one has been a project called OpenStreetMap, which is actually very active here in, in Japan. Uh, and all the companies that started uh, Overture had been working in OpenStreetMap. One of the, th there were a couple things that we felt needed to be done beyond that. And one was, um, we wanted to be able, if you're gonna, if open data is gonna be competitive in the market, open data needs to use data, all the data sources that are available to it. OpenStreetMap is, is very much a community focused mapping uh, project. Um, we all form a community, we go out and map our, our, our parts of the world. We add those together. If there are a million of us, lo and behold, you generate a map. But it's very focused on building a community. It's not very focused on using government data, for instance. And so government data is a new source of, or a relatively new source of open data. Governments are building very high quality data and they're offering it under open licenses. So if you want the best data, you'd want to be able to use that. And then we're just at the very beginning of starting to think about how data will be created through AI or, or uh, machine learning. And I think that's one of the areas that 
for us, we see, um, you know, as I, as I talked before about this idea of sensor-driven mapping, sensor-driven mapping combined with AI is really where this is going to go. So, one, so the first thing was, if open mapping is going to be competitive in the market, it needs to use all sources of data. Second thing is, it needs to be high quality, and that means it needs to go through um, a high level of, of validation um, and, and, and quality assurance. It's, you know, the, the conventional open source thing is many eyes make bugs shallow. I think I, that's about right. Is that about right? I think that's about right. Um, but the problem in data, in, in data is data doesn't represent opinions. Data, map data represents facts. It represents something is there. It is there or it is not there. And so um, when, when companies put out maps, they have to represent those facts. It's not open for debate. It's not a better way of coding. Um, and so what you don't want is you don't want someone to be able to go in and change those facts because then that propagates through the whole, the whole area. And there have been some, some examples of that. So one of the questions is, what would, what would open data look like if you put in uh, sort of high quality machine learning based quality and validation uh, uh, control? And the, the, third, the last thing is a little bit in the weeds, but um, the data needs to come out in, a, in, a, in an organized and documented schema. And, and to, I, I, unless you're, I, I'm happy to talk about it if you're interested, but the main thing is it needs to be in a documented schema so application developers know what it's com what's coming to them and can write their programs around it. That seems fairly obvious, um, but the, the other open source project doesn't have uh, as standardized the schema. And so that was one of it. And then the last part of that is you need to be able to attach data to it. So it's no longer good enough. Ten years ago, it was good enough just to know where all the roads were, but now you, you have to be able to attach data to that road. It's no longer good enough to know all the places. You need to be able to attach opening hours and, and reviews and pictures and things like that. And so the base map data needs a way of attaching data to it in the mapping world, that process is called conflation. And someone told me for every dollar they spend on data today, they spend two or three dollars on conflation. So what we wanted to do is make that really simple. And that was something that we called the Global Entity Reference System, which is very interesting. Um, if you're interested in that thing, I'll talk to you about it. Um, but, but essentially what it is, is every entity in the map has a stable identifier. It has a, a unique stable identifier that identifies that entity in the map. Now if I want to conflate data to that, as long as I replicate that identifier in the data, conflation becomes fairly simple. And, and it's very hard to do because things change and, and you have to kind of maintain that. But I think actually if we can do that, which we're, we're working on, I think that actually changes the whole mapping industry. So. Any questions? I'm, I'm happy to I'm, I'm jump in if you have some. Um, map. Or, or what you see as a map is consists of a lot of different types of data. Uh, the UN thinks there are about 14 types of map data, what they call themes. We're making six of them. So, uh, so uh, um, we're making, you know, as starting, we're making the six we thought were most valuable. So we have a transportation layer, which is the road network, but the transportation layer increasingly is transit and pedestrian and other mobility, uh, cycling and things like that. Uh, so we've got the transportation layer. We've got a places layer. Places is um, also called points of interest or POIs. That's all the, the, uh, the places of business. It is, um, having worked in the mapping world for a while, it is like the most hated uh, data set because places of business have an annoying habit of coming into business and going out of business. And while they come into business and they might have a lot of fanfare and announce they're coming in, when they go out, they go out very quietly. And so places data is highly volatile compared to streets um, and highly full of junk. Um, so uh, places data is another one we're doing. Uh, divisions is kind of code for something called administrative boundaries. Those are like uh, boundaries of countries and cities, and you can get down to neighborhoods and things like that. Buildings is buildings. It's, uh, it's knowing where all the buildings are uh, in the world. And uh, what we do there actually is interesting. We use four data sets, and the first couple are sort of surveyed. So they're, one of them is open street map data, which is sort of drawn by individual mappers. Then a lot of cities will survey and build their data sets. And then we use two open data sets, one from Microsoft and one from Google, which are pure open data. And um, that gets us to 
pretty good. We don't know how many buildings there are in the world, but we think 2.4, oh, I'm sorry, it's 2.4 billion, 2.3 million wouldn't be, 2.3 billion buildings uh, in the world, which we don't know if that's all the buildings in the world, but we think we're getting close to it. Um, addresses is obvious, we just started that one, and then base is sort of the rest of the stuff. It's like ground cover, boundaries, coastline. So we're making six. Um, there could be other ones, and um, you know, just as an example, I've been talking to a lot of people, a lot of map applications are around climate and environmental studies, and um, these are the type of map data that are highly interesting to the people who are, whose logos are on that slide before. Um, but if you had a lot of climate environmental groups joining, which some are starting to, um, I think there would be other types of data that would be as interesting. Land cover would be an interesting data. Um, so so I, I don't think we're limited to these six, but I think these six match our members' needs today. So. Um, and I'll just show a couple pictures. Um, uh, this is um, just to give a couple examples. Uh, one of the things I said is we use open data uh, from, from, very, from as any source we can get. Uh, that has high quality data. Uh, this is actually one that came out, um, we just did a release last uh, couple days ago on, on uh, the 24th of October, and we included the Japanese address data. So this Japanese address data is from the Japanese Ministry of Land, Infrastructure, and Transport. Um, this is government data that the uh, Japanese government entity collects and maintains, and they make it available as open data. And so. Um, you know, one question is why do governments do that? And we've talked to a lot of government entities, um, you know, obviously collecting it is that's sort of, you know, part of the things that government do, but why do, why do they make it open as, or available as open data? And the main reason that, that countries want to make their, this data available as open data is to have some sort of economic impact so that that data can be used for various business purposes or different reasons or things in government or things in the public sector, sector to create economic growth and environment or, and, and, uh, and, and an ecosystem. And the thing that Overture does is we go to them and say, you could have, if you think about the Japanese Ministry of Land, Infrastructure, and Transport, you could make this data, you could put it out on an open data portal, but it really only becomes valuable when it gets integrated with other data types for Japan and perhaps for other countries because people aren't interested, many, well, many people aren't interested in just a country's address data. They want that country's address data tied to the buildings and combined with other countries' address data. And so what Overture does for companies like this is we give them distribution. Essentially, the value to them is distribution. And you know, it's interesting because the countries actually, are, and this is true at the, at the uh, uh, national level, at the, like the, the sub-national, the prefecture or state or province level, and at the local level, they want that open data to get out and be used. I'll give you an example. If you think about uh, uh, governments have uh, cities have a lot of data on roads and what the road, if the roads are, that, are going to be open or closed, is there construction there, is there going to be a parade, are they shutting it down? They would like to get that out to citizens so that citizens don't get frustrated if they get routed down a street that's closed today. Um, and so one of the things they're looking for is how do we do that? What's our mechanism for doing that? And our, our our model for that is if they put it out in open data under certain standards, it can get pulled in, integrated with other data sets, and then made available to, to many, many other people. So, so that one just went in. Um, this is a, it's not a very good picture. Uh, the, this is a picture of our building data set. And, um, in our building data set, we use four different sets of data, but in, in Japan, it turns out for a variety of reasons, only two data sets really show up in there. So the, um, uh, the let's see if I get this right, the white ones here are, yeah, the white ones here are OpenStreetMap. So OpenStreetMap is a community that, that builds mapping data, and so the OpenStreetMap community in Japan is very active. And what you see is they've gone out and drawn, either drawn or gotten from the government building data, but where it's really good, and, and this, this, uh, the resolution's a little washed out, but if you were to look at this, 
the, the high spikes are where there's lots of data, and the white ones are OpenStreetMap. The green ones are from Microsoft. Microsoft is data. They take satellite imagery. They do machine learning on it, and they infer where buildings are from that. And so it's a little hard to see here, but OpenStreetMap, which is a community, has really good coverage in the big cities. And if you look at where Tokyo is or, or Osaka or the different cities, you see these big white spikes of OpenStreetMap buildings. A community tends to build map data where they are. And so using OpenStreetMap, we get really good coverage in the cities. Where you don't get really good coverage is in the rural areas. And it turns out there are buildings in the rural areas. That's where something like machine learning on satellite imagery can really fill in the rural areas. And those are the areas that are green. Sorry, this picture is much better on my screen than it is there. But, but if you see it in the screen, and so it makes a point that if you're going to build good open map data, you need to combine different sources. Because while a community might be very good at mapping um, a city area or places where mappers live, they might be less good in mapping small rural areas. And so um, this sort of shows the, the advantage of combining different sources and doing it. Now, if you think about it, th th this gets a little complex because what if a community member mapped a building? It's also going to show up on the, the satellite imagery machine learning version as well. And so one of the things the engineering ha engineers have to do is um, the, it's called conflation and deduplication. You have to add those data sets together and then deduplicate, and you have to make a decision on which one you're going to which one you're going to choose. If you have two representations, which ones are you going to choose? So there's sort of a rules-based model that says, you know, if we have the same building from two different data sets, we're going to choose in this order. So, um, also, I said we had uh, two AI-generated data sets, one from Microsoft, one from Google. Um, they're both open data sets made by those companies. The interesting, and I don't know why, but the Microsoft data is really good in Northern Hemisphere. So here we have a lot of Microsoft um, uh, buildings. The Google data set is really good in Southern Hemisphere. And so if you were to do this in Brazil, I suspect, I haven't done it, but I suspect you'd see um, m m many more Google buildings than you see Microsoft. So I, I don't know why, um, but Google and Microsoft are nicely doing that and putting it out as open data. So, so uh, I don't ask why, I just say thank you. So. Okay, and then this is the thing that, you know, that I think is ultimately, ultimately going to be, you know, maybe the major contribution here. If you think about mapping today, the thing that's driving mapping today is just this explosion of different data types that continue to make the applications better and richer and more accurate. And so I think a lot of people in the mapping industry looked at that and said, um, map data is exploding and they kind of pull their hair and worry about that because it's hard to put all that map data together and conflate it. But I think one of the insights um, that, that sort of came out of that is, yes, map data is exploding, but it's exploding in a very structured way. And what that means is there's not millions of new, well, there may, there's not the, the, the road network is not exploding. If you think about the road network worldwide, new roads are built every day, but they're not exploding. There's a lot of roads built, and buildings aren't exploding. There are certainly new buildings built every day, but the building database, um, it, it certainly needs management. You need to make sure when buildings go away and when new buildings come in, but it's not exploding um, in, in a way. And so what you realize is that those base layers, addresses, same thing, right? There are new addresses every day, but it's not exploding. So that becomes a much more manageable problem if you think of the base layers. What is exploding is all the data that attaches to that. And that's the reason we have better mapping apps, why uh, it's more and more useful. That's the part that's exploding. And so the insight, I think, was, was if you're going to make open data, and your goal is to make open data, you could say, we want to make all the map data in the world open. But you probably wouldn't be very successful because there's just too much activity in what we think of as the higher orders of data, the parts that are adding the richness and the variety and, and the difference in mapping. But you can make the base layers open. And, and so Overture's goal is to define a base layer for each of those six themes and build that as open. And so if you think about what you want to do there, you want to have it highly accurate. You want to have it very complete. So if you have roads, you want to have every road. If you have buildings, you want to have every building. Um, 
You want to have it highly up to date, so you want to develop mechanisms which say if a new road goes in, how do we detect that? If a, bu if a business goes out of business, how do we detect that and reflect it? But the thing we don't have to do is add in all the rest of the stuff. We don't need to add in the, you know, which credit cards a restaurant takes or what their menu is or what the pictures are, what the reviews are. That's the part that the, the ecosystem will add to it. And so then what we need to do is give the ecosystem a way of attaching it. Uh, very, and that's this thing called GERS. So this is sort of our model is we're building base layers and then we're assuming that if we, these base layers have stable IDs, adding data on top of that becomes pretty easy. And, and so that's kind of the model. Does that make sense? So, so we're, we're distinctly not trying to make all spatial data open. I, I don't think, I don't know that would even be a good thing. I'm pretty sure it's not a possible thing. Um, so this is, you know, right now what, what we saw sort of in the industry is, is it's, it's incredibly fragmented, the data's all over the place. If you're trying to pull this together, you're getting data from different places. And so let's say I've got, you know, let's say, uh, what's this place, the, you know, this place, this building, you might get data about this building from six different places and they may all refer to this building in a different way. If everyone could agree that this building has a stable ID, then all of a sudden tying that building becomes very uh, uniform and pretty easy. So those are the things that's really driving the, the fragmentation of the industry, the quality of the industry because people can't do this, and ultimately the cost. Again, you know, someone I talked to who works for a big mapping company said he spends uh, two to three dollars in data management for every dollar he spends in, in purchasing licensed data. So that's a pretty staggering cost. And so, our goal is to collaborate on the base layers, uh, make those once. Um, the reality is those are becoming commoditized anyway, so let's validate, let's collaborate on building them, collaborate on putting the validation, and then really try and work on um, the interoperability of that. Um, so it's a it's community project. Um, uh, it's kind of interesting. We, um, we work in teams. I, 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 I'm not an expert on open source code, and, uh, and so I always kind of think like, how is what we're doing different than uh, open code? I think there are, um, so there aren't that many big open data projects, it turns out. I, I didn't know this when we started this, um, but there's a lot of new ground, but there are significant differences between open data and open code. Um, one of them is, um, that open, like data represents facts, about, and map data represents facts about the world. It has to come from somewhere, whereas code, a good software engineer can write code, data ha usually comes from measurements of things, and those measurements end up being pretty expensive. And so we're, what we're doing is putting together this combination of you know, members, a community, an ecosystem that has data, and, and ultimately authorities to, uh, to go build this. Um, I was going to spend a little bit, is anyone here from the automotive industry? If, I, I'll, I'll go through this fairly quickly. Um, one, one, there are a lot of different uh, uh, markets. Maps are kind of a horizontal platform in, in the digital uh, you know, world. They're, they're horizontal, they cut through many, many different verticals. And so you know, automotive is one fairly obvious one. Um, but they're, you know, equally, you know, if you look at our, you know, Facebook uses them and, you know, Facebook uses them today because they want to know, basically, you know, Facebook's an advertising company and so they want to connect their people to local businesses, to businesses around them. So that's what they're using them today. But if you look at Facebook and where they're, or Meta, and look at where they're going, they're going to augmented reality. In augmented reality, we wear something on our, uh, heads that make, hopefully don't make us look like cyborgs. And then as we walk around the map, instead of looking at the map on our phone, the map is, we're in the map essentially. The, the map elements are on it. So they need highly precise building footprints. So everyone uses different things. The automotive industry um, is kind of interesting because uh, someone, someone in the automotive industry read that article about data is a new oil, I think or something like that, there was a famous article about data is new oil, and the automotive companies all said, hey, we've got data, we're driving around, we're collecting all this data, 
that's a new oil, this must be worth a lot. The problem is there was no real mechanism for the automotive companies to use that data to actually create value. And so what they got was these observations, and it turns out you know, a lot of people have observations. Cars drive around, they collect information, they have GPS, the GPS, they have, they're starting to have more cameras and the cameras are collecting information. They're, but they're increasingly available and very noisy. What they want is they want structured uh, data. They want that data built into maps. So GPS traces aren't a lot of good, but if you have a bunch of GPS traces and you can process them and, and validate them and turn them into map data and add road names to them and things like that, that becomes a valuable thing. And so what we saw in the automotive industry is a lot of collection of data, a feeling like this data was valuable, but actually not a very good mechanism for turning that into value. And so uh, one of the things is we've talked to automotive companies is, is to talk about, is this a model? Is this a model for, um, for your, your value? And so what we're talking with automotive companies is contribute some of that data and it, this has been a little bit of a, a hard thing to convince some of them, but if some of that data can go into, if you'll take some of that data and make it available as open data, then that data can drive some common base layers. And those base layers are common and they're shared. Y'all are gonna need them, um, and so, but they're also not differentiating. I mean, no one really makes great differentiation over knowing the road network down here. It, 20 years ago you did, not anymore. The 20 year, now everyone kind of knows the road network down here. So our message to automotive companies is share the data that will help maintain that road, road network because you don't want to do that on your own. But then also um, create data with your, with your, um, your, your detections in areas they add value. So we talked to one company and they said, you know, example is we've got cars out there and when we detect that the, ro the tires are slipping on ice, we know that that is an icy part of the road and that we ought to send our drivers warnings to go off hands-free driving and take the wheel and kind of go through that area. So that, and they viewed that as a competitive product that they would uh, allow to make their cars and their drivers safer than others. You might argue that that's a public good, which might be a, an open source, but that was not their perspective. But one of the things we talked about is contribute data in your sensors to build common open map layers and still have room to think about where you're going to uh, uh, make a difference in, and differentiate your cars. And one of the things I talk to companies about all the time is they all start and say, our data is proprietary, it's valuable, we'd never give it away. But if you talk to them, there's actually some of that data that's not very proprietary and they could give away. And then that allows them actually to focus their efforts on the areas that uh, are proprietary. Oops. Um, so TomTom's a sponsor and this is their model is, you know, TomTom says, we're gonna build on Overture, we're gonna get richer in contextual navigation, but we're gonna sell these other special services and special data services uh, and, and their model is based on an open base layer, uh, but you know, which it's hard to make money on selling open data, uh, but they are developing these other layers that tie onto it. And if you think about it from their perspective, if everyone adopts the open base layer, your total available market, your TAM just got a lot bigger. So the question is, how is it sellable? Uh, uh, you've got your base layer. Yeah, open. the base layer is open. The other layer is sellable. I think that's, I, I, and I, so let me take it out of that example and give you an example where people are selling it for sure, real-time traffic, right? There are companies that are selling real-time traffic and what they would like to do, so they've got machines over here that determine real-time traffic and flow. What they want to do is be able to sell that to people who are building navigation systems. What they need is they need to be able to attach their real-time traffic precisely to the road segment that real-time traffic affects. So that would be a case. I, I don't know, and there may be an example of an auto OEM selling their proprietary data. I would tell you with a reasonably high degree of confidence they think they can. I'm not sure if any of them are doing. Yeah, are you in the perfect position to also sell it? Me? Yeah, 
Uh, well, yeah, except we're, we're a project under the Linux Foundation, so we're a nonprofit. Um, so I, I think there is a business there, but it's not mine. Yeah. There is definitely a marketplace there. I mean, when, when you get there, if you think what, what happens, right, you have uh, users of open data oops, who are using the, the data. And, you know, right now, I mean, the good thing for me is if I say, who are my users of open data? It's Meta, it's Amazon. It's Microsoft, it's, you know, it's TomTom, it's Esri, which goes into all the government data. It's As you build that up, that, those users of open data, then you get to your point, which is now I've got some, some value-added data I want to sell to that. Now it's worth my while to add those identifiers in because now it makes it really easy to sell. And I think what's actually going to happen is the users of the data are going to make that a requirement. They're going to say, hey, if you don't have that identifier in there, it costs us too much to conflate your data in. Or, or, or you'll, you know, there'll be some, if I have to spend $3 for every dollar I spend, there's going to be some consideration of that. So, but, but I mean, you're absolutely right. Whether the automotive people will do it, I, I'm not sure. Um, okay, I, I'll just skip that. Uh, here's some documentation. Uh, the project's about two years old. Um, I think we're just getting started. I mean, I think it's, there's a long way to go. Maps are hard. And, uh, I, rem I remember that every day, but uh, I think we're just getting started, and uh, I think we have about five minutes if uh, there are any questions. Yeah. My question would be, why start a new project rather than doing the effort into making more distant memory? Yeah, great question. Um, it, I'm, it's not clear to me, and, and I say this having, so I, First contributed my first edit to OpenStreetMap in 2006, so I've been involved with them for a long time. It's not clear to me that the OpenStreetMap community wanted to do this. And, and if, you, if you look at, the, and I have a lot of respect for the OpenStreetMap community, but the OpenStreetMap community is first and foremost a community of mappers. And so if we're all a community of mappers and you're mapping your neighborhood, and all of a sudden I drop a bunch of AI based mapping data on top of the stuff that you've been curating, it's not great for community. And so, there, and, and if you know OSM, it's very hard to say what their opinion is, but um, I would say this, the companies that started Overture tried to make over, uh, OpenStreetMap into what they wanted for a long time, and I would say the OSM community fairly successfully <laughs> fended them off, and because they, they are what they want to be, which is a mapping community. It's a great community. This is something different. This is focused explicitly on the end users. Does that make sense? I, I can talk to you more about that, but it's, it, it, it's a great question and maybe non-obvious, but um, the companies that started this and the companies all, all worked in OpenStreetMap, but OpenStreetMap's focus is more on building a community of mappers, and Overture's focus is specifically on building map data for application developers. And that's subtle, but actually pretty important. So. <laughs> question? No question? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, that's actually one of the things we're we're starting to work on now. Uh, just to give you an example, um, places data. I've got one minute, so I'll be real quick. Places data, is, as I mentioned, is really hard because it, it businesses come and go, and so um, one of the things we're, we're doing in places data is if you built a group of companies that all interacted with a place. You might have social media posts of them, or you might drop someone off there, or you might pick up food there, or you might deliver a package there. All of those are what we started calling heartbeat signals, right? That means today, I detected a heartbeat. And if I have enough of those companies, and it's not 100 companies, maybe a dozen, if I have a dozen of the right companies, I can have a fairly good track of whether your business 
is here today and then next week I can check again. And so that's an example of using a community to get signals and then you, if you think about how you do that, you'd weight each of those signals, right? Maybe an Instagram post isn't as heavily weighted as like a business transaction, but you can weight those. And then that becomes a confidence score, right? So now I can say 99.9% .9 confidence. Um, so we're act we actually did that in Seattle. We're now doing it in, uh, in uh, a, a, a much bigger region. We're doing it in North America and Western Europe. And, um, and, but, but that's the type of thing where we, we start getting feedback and rolling it back. What we aren't going to do, and I know I'm over time, uh, what we're a little more reluctant to do, which is true in OpenStreetMap, is OpenStreetMap lets single editors edit. Um, and the community's pretty good at reverting. Um, but uh, you know, if, if you're going to application developers, you really need a higher trust level. And there have been some rather notorious examples of, of vandalism that didn't get caught. And it's, you know, it's not good. So. Okay, I think I'm at time. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm around and happy to answer any questions.